religion complete with strictly enforced virtues, internet inquisitions, sins, penance, public rituals, evangelization, iconoclasm, sacred texts, seminaries, and more. It is a modern leftist cult. It is in reality a one-word dialectical repository for such worldly philosophies as social justice, anti-racism, critical race theory, intersectionality, cultural Marxism, liberation theology, womanist theology, reproductive justice, scientific justice, ethnic studies, gender theory, queer theory, drag theory, transhumanism, posthumanism, DEI, SEL, ESG, climate change, environmental justice, or environmental racism. Yo. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you guys. Sorry. Uh you know how it is whenever you're doing these lives. But we're here and we're excited that you guys are here. And I think like uh maybe like even in the end we need to play again that uh that that short okay good job baby <laughs> good job because i was just like wow it's, it's kind of like daryl is daryl is, is rapping over there you know let me know what you guys think welcome Susie q welcome i see you didn't miss the bus the bus was late today okay but we tried so sorry <laughs> The bus was late, so I think we ended up missing some people along the way. So I'm sure they'll catch Uber, they'll catch a lift, and they'll find us. But the party will get started. Yeah, we'll have to circle around and pick people back up in the neighborhood. Yes. See, see, you know. Yes. Or the other bus will have to come and scoop them up. You know yes. what I'm saying? The, uh, yes. the the not, the eight thirty bus oh, will come through, man. Bus. You know. <laughs> and, uh, Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Man. Greetings to all. Greetings to all y'all. Hope everybody is well. Thank you, thank you, yeah, thank man. you. Yeah, man. So like, yeah. So today we're going to go through uh, uh, the Shepherds Conference, and you know, Daryl was one of the speakers. He he did a very good message. So I'm calling it that he pretty much just buried the wokeness at shepherd's conference okay so i don't see that there's no more need for us to be hearing anything that has to do with the wokeness all the social justice warriors <laughs> they need to repent in ashes and the sacrament like yesterday okay he did a very good job uh, a very nice message so be sure to share it okay like it's very uh he dropped receipts and you know like these guys right they that's their thing like okay they drop receipts that's what they do. They drop receipts. So uh, we're working on the uh, on the video right now. So just hang tight. We welcome all the new subscribers. Thank you guys uh, for subscribing to the channel. Be sure to like and subscribe and share. And thank you to you know like yeah the the day ones of the Barian of Barian babes. We appreciate you. Okay. A few minutes on the intro, if need to. I'm still working on a spring. <laughs> Fertilizing oh, oh. and propagation. Okay, all right. Okay, that, that's good. That that's good. is awesome. That is okay. wonderful, all right. Susie. That is wonderful, Susie. Yeah, man. That is cool. Well, yeah, I mean, so we, we got it uh, pretty much uh, lined up. I think we got everything there. One thing I'll say is, um, you know, we are going to, like, play it by ear, right? Like, um, I guess we're going to see how far deep to go into the actual message because it's obviously an hour long message. And if we're, if we're going to play and also comment on it, it will take, you know, very long if we do that because it is a one hour message, but we'll play it by ear, see what sections we're going to, you know, sort of let roll. And if we have to skip forward a little bit, then we can do that, you know, but, uh, We'll we'll see how it goes. I mean, we're just chilling. We're hanging out. You know, we're with yeah. fam, and we'll we'll do what we do. Monday watch party. Right. Okay. Right. 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 All right. So, cool. without further ado, was that the the popular demand to play the the uh the short again? Well, I mean, we could do that later. Okay. I mean, yeah. Yeah, we're going to play yeah. it later on because yeah. I think that thing is classic. Right. We we could play that later. That's not yeah. a problem. I mean, we'll definitely played later. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, yeah, 
let's let's see what we got. Let's see what we got. So uh, the message does uh, kind of start a few minutes in. So we're going to jump in from the point that it begins and let it roll and uh, comment as we go. So let's uh, let's bring that in here. Add that to the stream. And with that, we will let Daryl take it away. You need nodes. You always say you need to take you need to be taking nodes. You know how these guys do. Yeah, this is a lot. There's a lot. Of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there is a lot of information in here. So, okay. you know, definitely be ready to listen. <laughs> uh, here we go. Here we go. Let's do it. More direct than either read or stray in, positing wokeness as, quote, a multifaceted pseudo religion complete with strictly enforced virtues, internet inquisitions, sins, penance, public rituals, evangelization, iconoclasm, sacred texts, seminaries, and more. It is a modern leftist cult, unquote. Now, the truth is there are elements of each of those three perspectives from which we could develop an objective construct of what wokeness is. And though the term wokeness is regarded by many within evangelicalism as a benign colloquialism, it is in reality a one-word dialectical repository for such worldly philosophies as social justice, anti-racism, critical race theory, intersectionality, cultural Marxism, liberation theology, womanist theology, reproductive justice, scientific justice, ethnic studies, gender theory, queer theory, drag theory, transhumanism, posthumanism, DEI, SEL, ESG, and the latest addition to that ever-expanding panoply of cultural suppositions, climate change, or what a contemporary woke vernacular is commonly referred to as environmental justice or environmental racism. You can suborn every last one of those ideologies under that one word. Speaking of environmental racism, the noted theologian and biblical apologist Jane Fonda Jane Fonda offered the following commentary. This is just to give you an example of how all-encompassing wokeness is. Jane Fonda offered the following commentary recently on an episode of The Kelly Clarkson Show, saying this, quote, well, you know, you can take anything, sexism, racism, misogyny, homophobia, whatever, the war, and if you really get into it and study it and learn about it and the history of it and everything's connected, There'd be no climate change if it wasn't for racism, unquote. That comment by Jane Fonda is one of the most inane examples you'll ever come across of how wokeness is essentially an ontological abyss, a philosophical black hole that sucks every social, political, cultural, and yes, the the theological and ecclesiastical issue into it that the ideologies I noted earlier can all be suborned under the broader canopy of wokeness is a commentary on the fact that wokeness is essentially another form of postmodernism. The Stanford University Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines postmodernism as a set of critical, strategic, and rhetorical practices employing concepts, listen, employing concepts that are specifically designed to destabilize other concepts. You must understand that when you're dealing with woke ideologies. Okay, okay, so that's, yeah. You know. That's already like a mic drop, right. okay? Like right. that's already like a mic drop. It's just like, man, and I remember um, when Darrell was getting ready for uh, for this, he was like, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm getting ready. I'm, I'm, I'm preparing. Please pray. <laughs> and then, like, he show up there. I was just like, oh my gosh, what is this? You know, yeah, it was good, very, very good, very informative. And like, yeah, receipts all over the place, man. Receipts all over the place. Yeah. What was your take, baby? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean it's. Uh, so obviously, I used that first portion there to do the uh, the short and. I was blown away by how comprehensive his 
breakdown of what wokeness is, right? So because a lot of people are like, okay, what is wokeness? We hear the term being thrown around. People don't really know what it is. Mm. But he did such a great job of saying this is this is what wokeness is, right? Mm. Um, and then he breaks it down, you know, uh, the ideology, you know, the things that are contained within it. That's what blew my mind was how that long that list was. Yeah. And, and it's really real. It, it, might, it might not even be exhaustive. There's probably even more stuff in there. You know, because there's there's sections that I forget about, you know, there's things like uh, when like the DEI thing, you know, diversity, equity and, you know, inclusion or whatever it is like, you know, if you work in certain settings that you're you're seeing, you're seeing that all the time. Yeah. But I don't work in a setting where that's being enforced. But, you know, I was reminded of that. Right. Mm-hmm. That uh, DEI is an issue. And then the S E F it was the S E what's it called S E L S E L yeah uh it was that social emotional learning, so I, I guess that's for kids and you know in schools and the curriculums how they're approaching them, and it reminded me of things that we've heard man that that just don't make sense because why why would learning be thrown into this basket of these grave inequities that are facing society and need to be corrected so drastically right and 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 the correction is so heavy-handed it's such a heavy-handed correction because we know of like in schools how um you have kids that can't be uh given a grade lower than 50 percent and things like that like those are mandates right so it's just like right 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 so just so many things and it was such a comprehensive intro and um I think he did, he did just a wonderful job of that. And the point where we stopped is where he now starts to say, talking about what wokeness does now, yeah. right? What is its mission, right? To destabilize. So that's the first uh, word that he, he mentioned it. The goal of wokeness is to destabilize, right? Like a lot of postmodern stuff, right? This is like deconstruction, like everything. It's, it's all meant to yeah. destabilize. Man. Yeah. You know what I'm so yeah, yeah it was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, no, you know, uh, keep playing this right. song. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay tuned. I'm going to take it back a little bit so y'all can uh, follow along. Okay. Essentially, another form of postmodernism. The Stanford University Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines postmodernism as a set of critical, strategic, and rhetorical practices employing concepts, listen, employing concepts that are specifically designed to destabilize other concepts. You must understand that when you're dealing with woke ideologies. They are specifically designed, Mike Riccardi alluded to this earlier in his uh, message from earlier this morning. They're designed to destabilize other concepts. This is why in wokeness, two plus two can equal five. This is why in wokeness, you can no longer define definitively definitively and objectively what a man and a woman is. Destabilization is the goal. The key word in that definition of postmodernism, by the way, is the word critical, which means to criticize, which is subjective. It does not mean to analyze, which is objective. It means to criticize. In wokeness, literally everything, literally, is criticized and must be criticized if it is to be destabilized and deconstructed, which, as I said earlier, is ultimately the goal of wokeness. Wokeness is a scorched earth worldview from which absolutely nothing is safe. Nothing. Nothing is safe. One non-ecclesiastical example of this is from an article titled, Humanity is Doomed If We Let Woke Zealots Destroy Scientific Truth, published March 4th, 2023, on the website of the British media outlet, The Telegraph, in which journalist Zoe Strimple makes the following observation, quote, American universities devote pages and pages to the apparent new job of science to be anti-racist. In 2021, notoriously, Ivy League students at Cornell University were offered a course titled, quote, Black Holes, Race, and the Cosmos. 
Now I'm going to let that one settle for a second. <laughs> Black holes, race, and the cosmos, which gave students the chance to mold the following. Conventional wisdom would have it that the black and black holes has nothing to do with race. Surely there can be no connection between the cosmos and the idea of racial blackness, can there? Absolutely bizarre. Yes. Right. And they, uh, and he said the Ivy League schools. So like, what's the deal? Right. You know, like what is the deal? Like why? <laughs> It's so unbelievable. Like, but this is what happens. Like, this is exactly that wokeness is going to do. Even if the Ivy League schools have adopted this, um, the wokeness ideology, right? Mm -hmm. And then, should we still call them Ivy League schools? I mean, the fact that so this dismantling of ideologies has spilt over into the scientific realm. Right. And this is not like, OK, I'm I'm trying to disprove a theory or I'm trying to say that, you know, a certain uh, scientific idea is not scientific. Right. Like it, it does. It's not proper. It doesn't work the way you guys think it is like you're trying to correct the theory. Right. The math is off. This isn't it. It's like you're actually trying to discredit like black holes all all the research and everything that, that has been done on black holes simply because they're called black holes right oh, so black holes in space where we're talking about singularities like these are you know things you see in star trek right anybody yeah. watch star trek growing up star trek well you know what i'm saying or star wars probably knows about black holes right but but we're talking about that's how far wokeness has gone like it's it's like literally in everything so something that is supposed to be based on truth like science science is supposed to be based mm -hmm. on facts that you can prove and study and observe right that is under threat from the world of wokeness yeah clearly so because at this point remember this is the same issue now we are fighting we can't define uh what a woman is you see what i'm saying so by default it's just like oh oh nobody knows you see what i'm saying so biology doesn't know remember now you can't even say there's only male and female right, right. so all these things are cut from the same cloth and underneath it all mm -hmm. they just they, it's it's the deny of god that's just what it is so that's why to them it's just okay they're going to dismantle everything mm -hmm. including things that you simply cannot dismantle right you know yeah. Things so. based on fact. I know. You know? And I this know. is a great comment here by, by yeah. Susie Q. Parents paying 100 k <laughs> a year for their kids to get taught to be racist, yes. Marxist. I yes. mean, like, in yes. every way, right? In every way. Even in, in the world of science. Crazy. Yeah. You know? Crazy. Yes. Crazy, crazy, yeah. crazy. I know. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Um, Greetings. Uh, is this yeah. Nayoka? Yes, that's Nayoka. Thank you. Hey, you know? what's Thank up, you sis? Guys greeting, for greeting, greeting, by. greeting, greeting, yeah, greetings. Nice to you. Yes, Shout yes, out yes, to yes. You guys, okay? All right, let's let's yeah, carry we'll on, with, on. With, we'll with, on with Daryl here. Mm. This is madness. <laughs> All right, here we go. Contemporary black studies theorists, artists, and fiction writers, however, implicitly and explicitly posit just such a connection. So the postmodern mockery of truth that underpins wokeness is now extending well beyond the humanities into areas that until about five minutes ago have been spared. But a world in which, listen to Strumple here, but a world in which it is not only possible, but actively encouraged to strip science of its epistemological integrity, the quest for what is true and what is possible, and to treat it as though it were merely yet another discussion of people's feelings or a political platform for condemning racism and transphobia is a world that is not destined to last very long, unquote. She's absolutely right. She's absolutely right. Wokeness fits perfectly 
within that definition of postmodernism that I cited earlier, because among the myriad concepts that wokeness is fundamentally designed to destabilize or deconstruct is the concept of absolute truth. This makes wokeness a self-enslaving worldview when you stop and think about it. For by not accepting anything as being objectively right or wrong, wokeness subjugates its followers to the philosophical bondage of a capricious and ever-shifting paradigm of not only what is or isn't right, but what is or isn't righteous. That's why it is so punitive right now to deface a rainbow pride flag that's painted on the street. Do you know you could go to jail for that? Because that's not righteous. So in wokeness, the paradigm has shifted. It's not just about what is or isn't right, but what is or isn't righteous. You have to understand that distinction. That is why in many ways, wokeness is not merely an ideological or philosophical proposition. It's a holy religious framework as well, complete with its own theology, its own homardiology, and its own soteriology. And listen, when your professed worldview contains those three things, its own homardiology, theology, and soteriology, when your worldview contains those three elements, you not only have followers, you have disciples. Yeah, I do. Awesome point there. I, awesome, I, awesome point. I mean, yeah. you know... The way, I mean, because if their point, right, like remember what uh, she is just like, they want to dismantle absolute truth. Right. That is impossible. You can't do that because truth is objective, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, truth is God's idea. So, I mean, so technically they're just saying like, oh, they want to get rid of God. So anything that presupposes God is what they're after. So truth presupposes God. So they want to come for that. And, and it's so funny that um, we, uh, we were created to, uh, to worship, right? Like, so whatever else that we're doing, we're going to find ourselves, that's exactly what we're doing, right? We're worshiping. Mm -hmm. Either you're going to worship the creator or you're going to worship uh, the created things. So it's very interesting to see. And beknownst to them, they are cursed. To um, to dethrone God, they are pretty. This is like the Tower of Babel type thing. Right. You see what I'm saying? And then the shameful part is just like the people who are promoting these things. Uh, these are the, pe the the people we're saying that they're in what in Ivy League schools. Mm -hmm. So it's just like man, like can things be more upside down than what it is right now? It's crazy. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely crazy. I, I think I, I like the way he he pointed out that look, that this is a worldview, man. It has a theology. A, a Hamar theology, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, anyone who doesn't know that word is, you know, we're talking about the, the doctrine of sin here, right? Yes. So it has its own doctrine of sin. What What is sin? What is wrong with the world, right? Yes. And I love how he talked about the, you know, it's not about what is right, but what is righteous, right? What, yes. is, not, what is not right, but it's about what is not righteous, mm. right? Um, that was just so well worded, and, uh, and I think it helps to just, keep us in the right frame of mind when we look at these things. Mm -hmm. And it clearly, clearly has those those elements, you know, mm -hmm. theology, hamartiology, and a soteriology too, yes. right? So because yeah. so you're being saved by in, in, in the woke uh uh paradigm or the or the woke worldview is doing all this 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 virtue signaling, tearing down of of uh establishments and everything and, and ripping down whatever mm -hmm. is supposed to be uh, objectively true if it offends somebody like that mm. is what the, the goal is and that's how you know that's your soteriology right there mm. you know so mm. yeah man very uh very interesting he's dropping in jews okay for like sure. this is solid gold solid for sure gold for sure advising. for sure we carry on and when you have disciples you have evangelists and make no mistake brothers Wokeness is discipleship evangelism. It is making disciples. But as it specifically relates to the spiritual deceptiveness of wokeness and how that belief system 
is infecting the evangelical church in terms of both orthodoxy and orthopraxy, I want to suggest to you today that at its most fundamental level, wokeness is a man-centered approach to widening the narrow road to God. That's what wokeness is fundamentally. It's a man-centered approach to widening the narrow road to God. I say that in light of what Jesus himself says in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, as wokeness with all its deceptive principles, precepts, and tenets continues to be embraced and affirmed within the evangelical church, often with the willing cooperation and facilitation of its leaders, I want to suggest to you that the effects of such ideological accommodation can best be observed primarily, though not exclusively, but primarily in the following two ways. One, theological relativism, and two, ethnic tribalism. Theological relativism and ethnic tribalism. First, theological relativism. A prime example of how wokeness leads to theological relativism is Dr. Randy Woodley. Dr. Woodley is distinguished professor of faith and culture and director of Intercultural and Indigenous Studies at Portland Seminary at George Fox University in Newburgh, Oregon. When asked recently by a white female student how she could better understand the concept of decolonizing evangelistic missions, Dr. Woodley responded as follows. Now, before I quote Dr. Woodley, I want you to understand that what you're about to hear, I am quoting verbatim, verbatim. So Dr. Woodley was asked by a student, how can I better understand the concept of decolonizing evangelical missions? Dr. Woodley responded, quote, our job is first to observe where Jesus is active. Whether it's your next door neighbor or someone across the waters, it doesn't matter. Where is Jesus active? And once you find out where Jesus is active, then convert to that and that culture. Because our job as humble servants of Christ is to first convert to their truth, not to expect them to convert to ours, and to understand that God expects two conversions out of every process. And when I'm saying conversion, it's little c. Like, I look at salvation to me, a word that better captures salvation is healing. And healing is a process. We begin our healing, we complete our healing, but we are also being healed. So as Paul says, now are we much closer now to our own salvation or healing than when we first began. And then part of that is decolonizing our own thinking and as much as possible through the help of cultural guides, indigenizing ourselves to that culture And then at the proper time, when given permission to share our truth. And that's sort of how I understand mission and evangelism, unquote. Absolute theological relativism. That rather capitulative and acquiescent response from Dr. Woodley is replete with the language of theological relativism. But you see, that's precisely where the deception of wokeness leads. It leads you to a place where, as Dr. Stephen Lawson has often said, where your feet are firmly planted in midair. This is exactly where Dr. Woodley is. He's a man whose feet are firmly planted in midair. Yo, so, I mean, that point right there, that point right there, listen. So, yeah, just, just this idea that this is the approach now, right? This is the approach to so-called reaching people that this is a doctor, right? A, the, a doctor of, of some form of theology here telling students that no, when you go somewhere, you go and you lay down your worldview, you lay down your worldview and you just listen, you know, you just listen. 
and you you don't try to impose anything on these people mm. and at some point you can kind of maybe just tell them you're a Christian or whatever it is, but you're not even there to evangelize. That's essentially what's happening here. So it's like mm. the, the death of biblical evangelism, right? So going out into the world and telling people to repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand is not on the menu anymore. It's like, no, let's go there. I just can't believe that the doctor, you know, I can't remember the exact words, Dr. but Ridley. yeah, Woodley, Randy. Woodley. No, I'm saying, but the, the, the term like lay oh. down your worldview that he actually would tell students to lay down their worldview when they go and confront other cultures like that is absolute craziness to me, man. It's so crazy. So crazy. But more, more, there's more well, to it, man. Um, no, but here's the thing. Not long ago, okay, what happened when we, uh, what's his name, Ruzran, was talking with that, uh, the leader tone. What did he tell him? Like, you know what? No, don't, I don't want you to be talking about your Bible. Like, you know, leave that aside. And he actually agreed. Like, okay, fine, I'm going to leave that aside. It is the same principle. You cannot, um, like, if somebody is telling you, like, you should leave your Bible, you should leave your sword, and you're going into the battle, but they're carrying theirs. They're cutting theirs. They're not laying down their sword. Mm. So, like, the professor is telling the student that they should forget that, that, that particular worldview, right? right? What about his? Does he have a worldview? So, it's just, like, it's so crazy. Like, the stuff, like, th this is exactly that wokeness is going to do, right? It's stuff, like he says, but, like, when you press it, it does not make any sense. Like, when you press it, there's nothing there. And then the sad thing about it, these things have entered what? They've entered the church. So then people think like, ah, uh, no, we're just going to concentrate on one thing. Like, no, everything is connected, you know? Yeah. I think it was like very Joseph, like it's like a trend card. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. you just can't have one card, like everything is connected. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You have one, you have them more. Before you know it, the other ones are behind, right? Oh, yeah. like when the trend is coming, you're only seeing uh, the first uh, cards that are coming, right? Mm -hmm. Until the whole thing sort of like passes you by. By the time it finishes, it finishes passing you by, it's a wrap. Exactly. Exactly. More to it, man. That's because wokeness fundamentally is a worldview in which, as Pastor MacArthur says in his book, The Truth War, quote, objectivity is an illusion. Nothing is certain. And the thoughtful person will never speak with too much conviction about anything. That's Randy Woodley. See, in wokeness, objectivity is an illusion. Dr. MacArthur is correct. He, Dr. MacArthur con continues, strong convictions about any point of truth are judged supremely arrogant and hopelessly naive. Everyone is entitled to his own truth, unquote. That's why I titled this first part of my outline, Theological Relativism. Because you get a guy like Woodley, who says that when we evangelize others, our goal, first of all, is to convert to that lie, to convert to that falsehood. And then when they give us permission to share our truth. Now, the way I sort of exegete that, there's only one truth. Now, either their truth is true or my truth is true. They can't both be true. You're telling me that I need, to, I need to first evangelize them, and as I do so, I need to convert to their truth. Now, if their truth is truth, why evangelize them? <laughs> you see, in wokeness, objectivity is merely an illusion. It's a mirage. It's a phantasm. And that wokeness views objectivity as illusory is precisely why people like Dr. Randy Woodley are so evasive and non-committal when it comes to defending the biblical gospel. And when I say biblical gospel, I'm speaking of the gospel, which in Colossians 2.8 calls us to no longer be taken captive by philosophy and empty deception. You want a good two-word definition of wokeness? It's empty deception. It's empty deception. Perhaps Dr. Woodley's relativistic visage of evangelism can be better understood when considered against the backdrop of Portland Seminary's woke statement of faith 
which reads as follows. We believe that God has called us to be and to make disciples of Jesus Christ and to be God's agents of love and reconciliation in the world. In keeping with the teachings of Jesus, we work to oppose violence and war, and we seek peace and justice in human relationships and social structures. Now that statement may seem harmless enough on the surface, but it is abounding with woke euphemisms. Phrases like social structures, peace and justice, and agents of love and reconciliation are all merely woke verbalisms commonly employed by professing evangelicals who sanctimoniously consider themselves to be theologically and ecclesiastically progressive and who attend churches that have Black Lives Matter banners and pride rainbow flags conspicuously dis displayed as woke virtue sig signals pointing hell-bound sinners, sinners to a postmodern Golgotha. But Dr. Woodley isn't alone in his capitulation to the culture. Consider also what Andy Stanley, senior pastor at North Point Community Church in Atlanta, said recently concerning what, in his view, is the value that practicing LGBTQ men and women bring to the evangelical church. Again, I am quoting verbatim. Andy Stanley said, quote, if I can figure out how to get straight people as excited about serving and engaging as the gay men and women I know, we would have a volunteer backlog. That's my experience in our churches. A gay person who still wants to attend church after the way the church has treated the gay community, I'm telling you, they have more faith than I do. Well, I'm sure they do, Andy. <laughs> they have more faith than a lot of you. I know 1 Corinthians 6, and I know Leviticus, and I know Romans 1, and it's so interesting to talk about all that stuff. But a gay man or woman who wants to worship their heavenly father, who did not answer the cry of their heart when they were 12 and 13 and 14 and 15, God said no, and they still love God. We have some things to learn from a group of men and women who love Jesus that much and who want to worship with us. And I know the verses, I know the passages, but we gotta figure this out, unquote. You see, what both Dr. Woodley and Andy Stanley are demonstrating respectively is that in wokeness, the church is merely a social construct. That's all it is. Hey, man. <laughs> Andy, 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 Andy. Okay, Andy has made it. Um, this is two times the second time made it to uh shepherd's conference right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. even <laughs> dr MacArthur couldn't help it with just like you could be like what is andy doing okay i mean we've already done videos about andy stanley right. i actually have that video already on the channel you guys you can take advantage uh understand i think it's time i do a, a playlist exclusive to understand the playlist okay yes <laughs> the understanding playlist okay coming so it's already there i just have to put it together so uh we already know understanding has already kicked out the scriptures out there okay because he said we have to unhitch the old testament the only thing we need is the resurrection i don't understand how you're going to have resurrection because he he also discounts the new testament he just said we just need the biographies of jesus but you know he says like no but like you know if there's no need to believe in narrative of scripture scripture sufficiency and he was saying this where at the dallas theological seminar i'm like why didn't they kick that guy out of the stage and now he thinks he's arrived that uh they're actually having like a conference he actually has people in leadership in the church they, he has come to a conclusion romans one doesn't exist mm. the vedicus uh 22 2018 it's not in the bible and I actually did another video that just shows like, okay, understand and Brenda Robertson, they're just the same. Okay. One is just in front. The other one is behind. One is burning a candle on one end. The other one is burning a candle on the right, other end. Right. And it's just a matter of time. They, they're just going to meet in the middle. It's just like, it's so crazy. So 
don't get me started on Andy Stanley. Yeah, yeah, it could be a whole hour, man. There's so there's so much that could be said about Andy Stanley. I mean, I think just the the idea. You see how he's making the case, though. I love how Daryl's just oh, like yes. laying it out, where it's like he, he's like giving you, mm. you know, the evidence and the proof of this within the culture where you see these things happening, where you see this capitulation happening, mm -hmm. right? This laying down of the worldview mm -hmm. in order to, you know, that would, to them, draw in people, right? Especially with Andy Stanley. Mm -hmm. And this idea, man, this idea that, you know, because certain people have foregone the, the pleasures of sexual immorality, that they would receive greater honor than somebody who has done the same who's heterosexual you know <laughs> or as though there aren't other sins that people have battled and overcome and are just as worthy of us you know thanking god for that mm -hmm. that's just crazy to me man it's like you're obviously trying to sell something you're trying to sell something to 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 that demographic in order to endear them to you know going to his church so yeah, man. craziness. Yeah, but you know, hey guys over there, thank you for joining in the chat. What are your thoughts? What do you think about this? Because this is like drinking, like from the fire hours, and you know how these guys do, right? They yes, just thank yes. You, but they'll have like a show for three hours, four hours, and it's well prepared, and everything is like it's taking you uh, level one, level two, level three, level yes. four. You know what I'm saying? And then in the end, it's just gonna drop you out there. So. Just like, no, man, Wokeness was buried at Shepherd's Conference, okay? Yeah, that was a Wokeness funeral. But we continue. Thank you guys for stopping by, okay? Don't forget to subscribe, like this video. Thank you. And what do I mean by social construct? Well, consider that question in light of a 2003 white paper titled, Through a Mirror Dimly, Social Constructionism Through the Lens of Faith, written by Dr. Amy Quillen. Dr. Quillen is student ombuds and director of academic engagements and partnerships at Kent State University's Division of Student Affairs. In her white paper, Dr. Quillen outlines five philosophical components that are inherent to the idea of social constructionism. And as I quote Dr. Quillen, please listen very closely to see if you recognize any of the components she outlines as being present in one form or another in the statements I read earlier from both Dr. Woodley and Andy Stanley. Dr. Quillen writes this, quote, social constructionism purports that our beliefs, ways of thinking, and values are not inherently, innately, or objectively given, but rather are constructed within the framework of social interactions with others. Social constructionism suggests that A, reality cannot be objectively known, B, reality is constructed in the course of dialogue with others through the use of language contextually formulated and mutually understood, that's Randy Woodley, C, reality manifests itself through narrative, that's Randy Woodley, the culture, D rather, the culture in which we live both shapes and is shaped by our realities, Randy Woodley. E, the concept of self and human nature is not a universal one, but is stipulated by the culture in which, in, in which individuals find themselves. In other words, Quillen says, truth is not objective. Woodley. And F, the culture itself often marginalizes its people groups with its creations and categories and so-called truths, Andy Stanley. When you exegete both Woodley's and Stanley's remarks closely, you'll find evidence of all five components of Dr. Quillen's definition of social constructionism. 
But social constructionism is precisely how wokeness invades and becomes operative in the church as increasing numbers of woke pastors and woke elders and woke deacons and woke worship leaders and woke Sunday school teachers and woke lay people and woke seminary professors and woke parachurch ministry heads who have embraced the demonic lie that Christ's church is merely a social institution are placed into positions of leadership and authority. That's how theological relativism happens. And when the leaders of those churches and institutions embrace wokeness, theological relativism is and should be the expected result. The consequence of which is that the theological and spiritual direction of those institutions ends up being shaped by cowardly men who are unwilling to pay the cost for standing for the truth, if they ever were willing to stand for it at all, for fear of losing the attention, admiration, and acceptance they so desperately crave, not only from the world, but from worldly Christians who are in the church. It's with that unfortunate reality in mind that I wholeheartedly concur with Pastor MacArthur, who in a 2019 interview on the topic, Why Churches Languish Under Cowardly Pastors, said this, quote, there's nothing worse than a pastor who doesn't have any convictions. And when I say convictions, I mean convictions about the things that are laid out explicitly in scripture. If you will compromise what the Bible says, you're the worst substitute for a pastor. We of all people must take what the word of God says. It must become part of our conviction to such a degree that we will earnestly contend for the faith, that we will fight for the faith, that we will boldly proclaim the faith even if it means death, unquote. Needless to say, the church is not a social construct, far from it. As the 19th century Scottish Puritan James Bannerman reminds us in his classic book titled The Church of Christ, quote, the church is a divine institution while all others around it are human. It is a city whose builder and maker is God while all other societies have been created by man. And the Christian society, thus founded and maintained by God in the midst of a world where all around is human and earthly, must have been established for no trivial or ordinary end." Unquote. But not only does wokeness lead to theological relativism, it also results in ethnic tribalism ethnic tribalism. On March 9th, 2018, the New York Times published an article titled, A Quiet Exodus, Why Black Worshippers Are Leaving White Evangelical Churches. The article highlights a group of black Christians who formerly were members of churches with predominantly white congregations who were personally grieving the fact that their white pastors were not using their pulpits as woke soapboxes to pontificate about racial, re racial reconciliation and social justice. Consequently, those individuals engaged in what the article termed a quiet exodus from those churches and subsequently began to seek out churches where they would feel more valued and appreciated for who they are as black Christians. Unlike those churches to which they formerly belong that has simply failed to realize how incredibly blessed they were to have had them as members of their congregation. That kind of self-exalting hubris is reflected in this comment by Dr. Shaniqua Walker Barnes, who in that New York Times article said this, quote, we, that is black worshipers, we were willing to give up our preferred worship style for the chance to really try to live this vision of beloved community with a diverse group of people, but that didn't work, unquote. That comment by Dr. Walker Barnes is an example of what I would describe as a kind of woke semi-Pelagianism. Semi-Pelagianism teaches that the whole of humanity is tainted by sin, but not to the extent that we cannot cooperate with God's grace on our own. In woke semi-Pelagianism, black Christians acknowledge that they are tainted by sin, yes, 
but not to the degree or extent that white Christians are. Consequently, see, here's where it gets hard for you to hear. Consequently, black Christians, only because they're black, are viewed as spiritually superior to their white brothers and sisters. That's because in wokeness, melanin is an indicator of sanctification. The darker your skin color, the more holy you are, which places the onus on those with less melanin to demonstrate and prove their probity and rectitude to those who have less melanin. No lies detected. None. No lies detected at none, all. Right? None. None. I mean, that sure. is exactly what it is, right? The more melanin, the more sanctified. The more melanin, the more you should be heard and other people should be silenced, right? So this is that whole, what we were hearing, especially in the last couple of years here of like, oh, no, you know, white people need to be quiet. You know, there's the spaces where white people just need to listen. Yes. Right? Y'all just mm. need to listen. Mm. Listen to the black people. Listen to the grievances. I mm. mean, like, this is... Mm. So spot on and, and hearing it described that way though, right? That is, it's, it's, this is essentially what it comes down to, mm. you know, the more melanin, the more sanctified mm. and, and using that semi Pelagianism as, as I, uh, the, 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 uh, the metaphor there was just, was brilliant. It was brilliant because that's what it is. It's like, no, you know, you, you know, you're not quite as depraved as other folks and you can still kind of get there. Um, mm. uh, you know, <laughs> it's crazy. No, I thought that was, you know, that was shots fired for sure. Mm. And, you know, like, you know, this is how Daryl operates. They take no prisoners. So if they are representing something, they're just going to present it as it is. Okay. Right, right. And he says what? He doesn't care. They actually have like, you know, their mugs, their t-shirts. I don't care. He actually has like a theme song. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yes, he actually has a theme song. I don't know. We need to find that song for some reason. Like, you know, I don't, I, I don't care. He actually has a theme, theme song. That's very interesting. Yeah, so this is the, in fact, this movement is still going on, right? They uh, leave out out. Leave out loud. Leave out loud. Well, yeah. he, he hasn't, he's going to get to oh, that. He's going to get to he that. He hasn't even okay, brought so that up. So that's I'm coming up. The guy, yeah, so that's... I'm going to hold on. Okay. Yeah. So let's listen in. Thank you guys for coming in. Enjoy. So when Dr. Walker Barnes bemoans that her ecclesiastical diversity experiment didn't work, what she's actually implying is that her fellow black congregants wanted it to succeed while white congregants didn't. Like most woke Christians, Walker Barnes's problem wasn't that her church wasn't multi-ethnic. Her problem that was that her church wasn't multicolored. Do you understand the difference? So you can be in a room full of people whose melanin is, actually, is exactly the same shade and have a multi-ethnic group. What Walker Barnes had a problem with was that there were too many white faces in her church. So as a black person, let me take the high road and show you white people how it's done. Man, don't get me started up here. That was 2018, the quiet exodus. Fast forward three years to 2021 and enter onto the scene self-described, quote, religion and race historian, unquote, Dr. Jamar Tisby and his hashtag Leave Loud initiative, the antithesis of the quiet exodus that I was just speaking about. In the notes from the March 8th, 2021 episode of Jamar Tisby's Pass the Mic podcast, I found these comments, quote, in recent months, we've seen a surge of black leaders and congregants in predominantly white or multi-ethnic churches and Christian spaces decide that it's time for them to go. We bear witness to the hurt, harm, and frustration that our siblings have experienced. Enough is enough. It's time to hashtag leave loud. To hashtag leave loud is to tell our stories, to name things for what they are, to take back the dignity we've lost while being in institutions that don't value the fullness of the image of God within us and to go, listen to this, and to go where we are celebrated and not just tolerated, unquote. 
The hashtag leave loud movement is an excellent example of ethnic tribalism as woke orthopraxy. But where does the orthodoxy that undergirds that kind of orthopraxy come from? Where does it come from? Well, in this case, it comes from Tisby himself. In response to the question, when is it time to hashtag leave loud, Tisby, in a Facebook watch video dated March 15, 2021, said this, quote, if we, meaning black Christians, if we don't leave, we actually enable the toxic culture that we struggled so mightily against. If there are no consequences for an organization remaining stuck in racial recalcitrance, how will it ever change? I'm not saying that this is a magic bullet, but if people of color leave, if black people leave, maybe that will send a message, unquote. So black people leaving is like a little sign of protest. That's basically what he's saying right now. So black people leaving the churches, they should do it because they didn't get what they wanted, essentially. That's what it comes down to. It's like you, you leave because you did not get what you wanted. But they are protesting. Right? They are protesting who? Pro protesting not getting what they wanted, not being <laughs> celebrated, embraced, being um, treated like VIPs. It's it's not even it's not even about fairness anymore. It's like you want you want more than fairness. You know, it's not because because I doubt that you can go to any of these churches and actually find that okay, people were being the black people were being mistreated. No, it's just that no, they they just weren't getting what they wanted. You know, they just weren't getting what they wanted. They weren't getting once once all this talk came about of, of like black people need to be regarded a certain way mm. and and um you know this this bowing down to again this whole mm. thing of like okay more melanate more melanin and more mm. more sanctified right mm. this bowing down that was supposed to occur from everybody else if if you if you were attending a church if you drank that Kool Aid and you were attending a church mm. and this didn't happen for you mm. then Jamar Tisby's uh, advice for you mm. was to leave that church, mm. right? So not to seek biblical reconciliation, right? The way the Bible says, okay, no, you work out things with your brother or sister, ask for forgiveness, all those kinds of things, right? You you work things out, you know, churches, any church is, is messy. Church life is messy at times, right? And there's need for reconciliation. So if people were really actually offended, I'm, I don't think that the first impulse should be, oh, you need to leave. You need to leave. Mm. Like off of just off of just that purely, mm. I, I don't see it. I don't see it. Yeah, but for me, it's almost, if you're saying that you're protesting, right? You're saying that you're leaving. So which means you're affirming that the church is owned by quote unquote white people. Correct. If you know what a church is, if you know the doctrine of ecclesiology, there is no way you can operate like that. So people are operating like that because they, they zero view or a low view. I, I, I mean, low view will be generous. They have zero view what a church is. After, if you know what a church is, like, you know, the church belongs to Christ. So it doesn't matter what you look like, right? Like everybody has to conform to that says the Lord. And we already have the, you know, what a church should be like, the structure and everything else through the scripture. Now, this is the same thing that uh, uh, issues with um, MLK 50, right? Where you have uh, past um, village church, Machand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I have 10 elders and there was a, one, there's a black one, but he's not qualified, he's a seven. Right. But because he's black, He's still going to give the eldership to the uh, to, to the, the one who qualifies as a saving. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we already have the qualifications of elder in Scripture. Read Titus one. Read uh, Timothy. So now that's his exact. Now he's finding himself doing this uh, literalism issues. You see what I'm saying? Because now you are abandoning what the Scripture is saying. You are applying whatever else you want, right? By having this so-called like a different elder. So I do not understand how, uh, you know, Jamatis Betiso, you know, as uh, Jason uh, calls him. <laughs> he is the one who is working with Abraham X. Kindi, the one who promotes racism 
okay and the disguise as anti-racism just like okay, does that make sense so you are working for this guy and then you're telling your your brothers and sisters to leave the so-called like white churches so now when they leave where are they going like where does this say uh the church belongs to christ it's the church of god it's yeah, like yeah exactly and, 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 it's, and thank crazy. you that's exactly what susan q yeah. says so the church exactly. belongs to jesus so jesus also gets to make the rules of yes. who's qualified and who's not qualified yes. and it is not about skin color it is not about whatsoever. character yes. it's about character because you rather have the man who whatever color he is yeah. but he's qualified, he's qualified. to, he's to do that to job because it is a very very difficult task to be an elder right yeah. so and of course yes this this in the immediate context what he's talking about here is not about eldership but it applies as far as this this partiality that we're seeing applies to that realm too but uh let's roll keep rolling because we got a lot to go let's go now i have to say this at this point i am constantly amazed at professing christians who somehow feel entitled to display such prideful arrogance as Tisby's about a literally skin deep attribute of their personhood with which they had absolutely nothing to do with. Nothing. See, Tisby's hashtag leave loud is hashtag hermeneutics. See, hashtag hermeneutics won't work. It may get you likes and follows and whatnot on social media, but this is patently unbiblical. It irks me to my core to hear anybody talking about, oh, I'm proud of, to be black. I'm proud to be Hispanic. I'm proud to be Asian. I'm proud to be white. As if you had something to do with it. You had absolutely nothing to do with who you are. Zero. And if I look angry, it's because I am. A literally skin deep attribute, skin deep attribute of your personhood. And you want to boast that you're proud of that? Perhaps in Tisby's case, the roles of potter and clay have somehow been reversed. But you see, again, that's what wokeness begets. Wokeness begets a view of the church as seen through the lens of ethnic partiality and privilege so that the church is treated as if it were an ecclesiastical arm of the NAACP whose sole purpose is to accommodate the cultural worship preferences and predilections of black Christians who think the church exists to glorify them as opposed to glorifying Christ. And if any of those preferences are not accommodated, then of course, it can only be because the church is racist. That can be the only reason. So I got a hashtag, leave loud. Speaking of race, Acts 17, 26 provides a one-verse apologetic against the unbiblical and unscientific idea that there is such a thing as human races. Acts 17, 26. You want an apologetic against that idea of race? Acts 17, 26 gives it to you in one verse. That verse in the NESB reads, and he, that is God, made from one man, that one man being Adam, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. The word nation in Acts 17, 26 is the Greek noun ethnos, from where we get our English word ethnicity, ethnicity. Now, question for you men. How many of you men have ever eaten at a restaurant that specialized in racial cuisine? <laughs> How many of you men have ever had your wife 
prepare for you a meal that came from a cookbook of racial recipes. The correct answer is none. There's not one person in this sanctuary today who has ever eaten at a restaurant that specialized in racial cuisine or conversely who has ever had his wife prepare for him a meal that came from a cookbook of racial recipes. Why do you think that is? You probably eat restaurant cuisine. meal by Peace. Important. It's important because there is no such thing as biological human race, or for that matter, human races. Consider that against what Scripture teaches in James chapter 3, verse 7, which reads, For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. You see, before Darwin came along, the word race used to be used to categor categorize types of things, kinds of things. You had races of plants. You had races of animals. Darwin comes along and just blows that up. But the word race in James 3, 7, is the Greek noun phusis, P-H-Y-S-I-S, which denotes the constitution or form of a person or thing by its nature, by its nature. The word, matter of fact, the words species and race in James 3, 7 translate to that same Greek noun, phusis, meaning a type or kind of person or thing. It doesn't mean an attribute of that person. In wokeness, race is a mutable, alterable, impermanent social construct. You must understand that. Even the wokest people on the planet, critical race theorists, have acknowledged that fact. I like to say that I have a, in my apologetics, Anyone seen the Godfather trilogy of movies? <clears throat> I can't recall if it was Godfather 1 or 2, but young Michael Corleone is saying to someone, my father always taught me to keep my friends close, but my enemies closer. See, in wokeness, you have to read your enemies. You have to read your enemies. See, it may blow your mind to know or to, to realize here that even critical race theorists acknowledge that there is no such thing as human race and yet they peddle the race idea. Why? Because you're ignorant about it. Even critical race theorists understand this. In the Handbook of Critical Race Theory and Education, one of today's leading proponents of critical race theory, Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings, a professor in the Department of Educational Policy Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. By the way, the University of Wisconsin-Madison is the birthplace academically of critical race theory. That's where CRT was born. The University of Wisconsin-Madison in the summer of 1989, and Dr. Gloria Lassen Billings was a part of that cohort. Gloria Lassen Billings says this in the Handbook of Critical Race Theory and Education, quote, biologists, geneticists, and anthropologists all agree that race is not a scientific reality. Despite what we perceive as phenotypic differences, the scrutiny of a microscope or the sequencing of genes reveals no perceptible differences between what we call races. As members of the same species, see, members of the same phusis, as members of the same species, Human beings are bio biologically quite similar, she says. Thus, while critical race theorists accept the scientific understanding of no race or no genetic difference, see, they're acknowledging this. We also accept the power of a social reality that allows for significant disparities in the life chances of people based on the categor categorical understanding of race, unquote. 
See, race is a social category. Even critical race theorists acknowledge that race is a myth. There is no such thing as human races. There is only one human species or kind which is comprised and constituted of various ethnicities. Are you hearing me? As those who are in this world but are not of it, that's John 17, 14. We need to unconditionally reject the socioculture nomenclature of the world and commit ourselves to using biblical terms and categories. The proper meaning biblical term is ethnicity, not race. Stop using race. Another example of how wokeness manifests itself as ethnic tribalism is James Galliard, senior pastor at Word Tabernacle Church in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Shortly after the beating death of 29-year-old Tyree Nichols, a black man, on January 8, 2023, at the hands of five black Memphis, Tennessee police officers, the video of which was subsequently released to the public, Pastor Galliard made the following remarks to his World Tabernacle congregation. You might want to scoot up close to listen to this one. Again, I am quoting verbatim, quoting Pastor Galliard. I did not personally watch the videos because I needed to be able to preach to y'all without being an angry black man. And so I personally was not able to look at them, meaning the videos. What I will tell you is that the answer has always been and always will be God using the African-American church as an agent of moral and cultural change in our community. It has always been that. It will always be that. And so, and when I say the quote African-American church, unquote, I'm not talking about a church of only black people. I'm talking about a church that understands that the gospel is justification by faith and social justice. And so whether those are black, brown, or white people that embrace that, when we embrace that and when we give and recognize that we don't live by bread alone, but by our giving we provide a voice, we provide funding to the voice of change. And so when we don't give, particularly to African-American churches, or churches that believe that the gospel is justification by faith and social justice, when I do not give to those environments, I am perpetuating the Tyree Nichols situations of our society. So he just added a sixth solar. <laughs> those words from Pastor Gilliard are an excellent example of what my good friend, Pastor Tom Buck of First Baptist Church in Lindell, Texas, rightly describes as woke hermeneutics. Listen, brothers. When the soteriology to which you profess to subscribe is merely a woke hybrid of sola fide and socialis justitia, or social justice, you don't need a savior. What you need is a social worker. <laughs> you don't need redemption. You need reparations. If that's your soci soteriology, perhaps... Pastor Gailyard is unfamiliar with what the Apostle Paul unambiguously declares in Galatians 2.16, that a man is not justified by the works of the law, including works of social justice, but by faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed, Paul said, in Christ, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Now, Pastor Galliard will disagree with that. We just heard it from his own mouth. Now, I don't know. I don't know if he would profess to be a believer. But I'm convinced that these words from Dr. Thomas Sowell, from his book, The Quest for Cosmic Justice, are nonetheless true for many woke Christians today. 
In that book, Sowell said this, quote, Envy was once considered to be one of the seven deadly sins before it became one of the most admired virtues under its new name, social justice. You see, the woke hermeneutics of Galliard, Tisby, and other such propagators of black liberation theology is merely the fruit of generations of ethno-ecclesiastical tradition in which churches with predominantly black congregations have come to view themselves precisely as Dr. Albert J. Rabito describes in his book, Slave Religion, the Invisible Institution of the Antebellum South, namely as, quote, an agency of social control, a source of economic cooperation, an arena for political activity, a sponsor of public education, and a refuge in a hostile white world, unquote. That's how most black churches see themselves today. Where was the gospel in any of what Rabbitoh just said? Nowhere. Nowhere. But notwithstanding the woke hermeneutics of Galliard and Tisby, one of the more egregious examples of ethnic tribalism can be found in the book titled The Divided Mind of the Black Church, Theology, Piety, and Public Witness by Reverend Raphael Warnock. Warnock serves as senior pastor at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. By the way, Atlanta is my hometown. Ebenezer Baptist Church, Warnock succeeded Dr. Martin Luther King, who pastored there previously for decades. Warnock, in my opinion, is the most ardent proponent of black liberation theology in the evangelical church today. And in the aforementioned book, Warnock, Warnock writes this, quote, with the encroachment of conservative biblical fundamentalism, now let me pause right there, that phrase conservative biblical fundamentalism can be translated white evangelicalism. With the encroachment of conservative biblical fundamentalism and its authoritative claims to absolute biblical truth, let me pause again, are you seeing how absolute truth is attacked woke person after woke person after woke person, even in the church. It's authoritative claims to absolute biblical truth. The black church needs, now more than ever, a critical theological principle for probing the meaning of black Christian identity. I submit that the concerns of the poor and the most marginalized members of the black community and nothing else must be at the center of that much needed conversation. Absent that serious and sustained conversation, black theology has been left without a robust public witness within the very institution that gave birth to its prophetic voice and the black church has been left without the critical tools necessary for probing the theological meaning of its black identity and what that might mean in this moment for a nation in crisis, unquote. Did you catch those tribalist phrases? Black Christian identity, black identity. You can't get more tribalist than that, but that's what the contemporary black evangelical church is about today, social justice. The gospel is nowhere to be found. Nowhere to be found. Listen, my brothers, there is one church, okay? One. There is no black church, no brown church, no white church, no red church, no yellow church. There is only one church. There is only one church of which Christ Jesus himself is the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, that is in Christ, not in Tisby, nor Gilliard, nor Warnock, nor Woodley, nor Harrison for that matter, but in Jesus Christ. We are being built up together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit, Ephesians 2. Yo, 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 just making sure y'all are still there. 
Making sure y'all are still there, man. I know. We are getting it in. This is this is just good stuff. This I is know. good stuff, man. And and I love bring, bringing it back home. On the foundation that is Christ, man. Cornerstone. You know what I'm saying? Not on any other false ideologies or nothing, man. Cornerstone is Christ. There's some funny stuff. Chick, chicken grease always with the. I know with, <laughs> with the funny comments. Yeah, I find that one. They want chicken grease. What's so that's from the book of fish greasians. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man, yeah. That was, yeah, that was, uh, that is so funny. That is so funny. Yeah, man. Um, uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Idaho. Mm -hmm. I know you yes, were there. Yes. Oh, I'm jealous that you were there because, yeah, this conference was fire. Right. Fire, fire, right. we, fire. We'd love fire, to hear fire, your stories, fire. Idaho, yes, Idaho know. Joe. You know, so. We'd love uh, to hear some stories from the conference for sure. Uh, yeah, so, uh, Thank you uh, so much for uh, for joining in. Yes, man. The way he uh, he talked about it's like I was just like, wow, the the, the the place is quiet, right? I'm like, okay, man. If this was like um, what do you call like at a Pentecostal church or at a charismatic church, you know, people would be screaming or going up front to go put an offering. You know what I mean? Because it was mm. just like, man, you killed it. But you know, hey man, reformed over there, but it's just quiet. I think they clap, they they clap their hands, which is yeah. Fine. No, there was it's a lot of cheering. I mean, this yeah. this is big. You can't hear the crowd because yeah. they, they they're so far away from his microphone, mm -hmm. right? And there's like thousands of people, so you can't hear that. Yeah. But nah, I mean, just just good stuff. I mean, we on the the home stretch, so to speak, here. Yeah, so we're gonna let y'all finish, you know, and listen listen strong and and enjoy the last uh, section over here. We would all do well to reject the divisiveness of woke hermeneutics and consider what God's word says in such texts as 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, according to the sarx, S-A-R-X in the Greek, which literally means according to the physical substance and characteristics we possess. And that includes your ethnicity. We don't recognize anyone anymore according to those characteristics. I have a name. My name is Daryl Bernard Harrison. He is not that black guy, Daryl Bernard Harrison. I'm not African American. Don't use labels. If I come to meet you or you introduce yourself to me, do not use labels with me. 1 Corinthians 12, 18, God has placed the members. Hear me, Jamar Tisby. God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. And you got the nerve to pack up and hashtag leave loud because they don't celebrate you. Acts 10, 34, 35. Peter declared that I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation, in every ethnos, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome. In, in the Greek, that word welcome is the word acceptable. The man who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. whether viewed through the theological relativism of Dr. Randy Woodley or the ethnic tribalism of James Gellyard, Jamar Tisby, and Raphael Warnock, wokeness is a spiritual cancer which sadly is aggressively metastasizing throughout the evangelical church today. It is a malady which, not unlike cancer, is destroying the church from the inside. You will be shocked to hear some of the stories shared with me and my Just Thinking ministry partner, Virgil Walker, by fellow believers as we travel across the country, speaking at churches and conferences on this subject, some of whom approach us in tears after having spent literally decades in a local church, they're now finding themselves searching for a new church home because their former church went woke theologically. And as I reflect on those stories, I'm reminded of these words 
from the book Heaven Taken by Storm by the 17th century Puritan Thomas Watson, who said, quote, error is an adultery of the mind. Truth is an antidote against error. The reason so many, listen to this, the reason so many have been tricked into error is because they either did not know or did not love the truth. Now, which of those two categories do you fall in? Wokeness is a deceptive, destructive, demonic mirage in which salvation is disguised as social justice and redemption is camouflaged as reparations. It is a false gospel whose message is built upon the postmodern quicksand of theological relativism and ethnic tribalism. In his sermon titled, The Hallmarks of God's True Church, Pastor MacArthur said this, quote, please listen, brothers, please listen closely. Pastor MacArthur said, the worst battles the church fights are not outside, but inside because you have people defecting to Satan's agenda. It's foundational to the church then to understand that there is a very, very subtle conflict going on all the time. And it isn't that you wanna be unloving, it isn't that you wanna be a fighter all the time, but it is for the sake and the safety and protection of the church that you have to know what's coming. And you have to fight the weapon. You have to fight with the weapon of the truth, unquote. MacArthur said, you have to know what's coming. The Apostle Paul urged the believers in Ephesus to no longer be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. This message is titled, The Spiritual Deception of Wokeness. The word scheming in Ephesians 4.14 is the Greek, da- Greek noun methodeia. Methodeia, which denotes erroneous methods, tactics, and strategies deliberately designed to lead others astray. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 11, that we are not to be ignorant of Satan's schemes. Now consider that apostolic injunction in light of what the 17th century Puritan Thomas Brooks says in his book, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. In that book, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, Thomas Brooks says that the first device Satan uses against believers in Christ and against his church is to present the bait and hide the hook. to present the bait and hide the hook. That is precisely what wokeness in all its spiritual deceptiveness does. It presents the bait of unity, justice, and equity while hiding the hook of division, partiality, hatred, envy, jealousy, and covetousness. As my friend John Benzinger, who pastors at Redeemer Bible Church in Gilbert, Arizona, writes in his book, stand, Christianity versus social justice, quote, the social justice movement is not Christianity. The message, the methods, the mission, the desired outcomes are not Christian. It is an anti-Christian philosophy disguised as truth and love that has captured much of the visible church. Like a virus, it is a foreign antibody injected into the body of Christ. The social justice movement is poisoning the church, spreading strife and attacking the very heart of the gospel, unquote. Now, let me ask you, brothers, when wokeness comes for your church, and notice I didn't say if, I said when. When wokeness comes for your church, what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? Are you going to stand firm on the sufficiency and authority of Scripture? Or are you going to cave 
and bend the knee to the woke mob, a mob which very likely will arise from inside your own congregation. What are you going to do? You're going to fold up for fear that you'll lose some of your members to a quiet exodus or some leave loud movement? Or perhaps worse, they'll attempt to force you out of your church altogether because you refuse to homiletically morph into Martin Luther King Jr. on Sunday mornings. Now, as I close, my call to action to you and to me, as we toil together in the power of the Holy Spirit too, as the Apostle Paul exhorts us in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, destroy speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. My call to action to you is simply this. Keep the main thing the main thing. Keep the main thing the main thing. I say that in light of what Jesus said to his disciples in Mark chapter 1, verse 38. He said, let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also. For that, preaching the gospel is what I came for, Jesus said. Jesus kept the main thing, the main thing. J.C. Ryle put it this way in his expository thoughts on the Gospel of John, and with his words I will close. Quote, do we do any work for God? Do we try, however feebly, to set forward his cause on earth, to check that which is evil, to promote that which is good? If we do, let us never be ashamed of doing it with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. The world may mock and sneer and call us enthusiasts, but let us work on unmoved. Whatever men say and think, we are walking in the steps of our Lord Jesus." Unquote. I echo that exhortation to you from J.C. Ryle let us work on unmoved. And if I may be so bold, let us not only work on unmoved, but let us also work on unwoke. May our great God, whose gospel you are privileged to preach by virtue of his unmerited grace and mercy, continue to equip and strengthen you to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm. Good stuff, man. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Whew. Yeah. Very strong closing. Very strong closing. Great exhortations there. Um, I like the quote from J.C. Rao. You know, you know, don't be moved. You know what I'm saying. And, and then also, when he talked about, um, you know, Daryl just has a great way of just putting words together when he talked about the, uh. you know, people wanting you to morph homiletically into. MLK on a Sunday, right? Like this is like an ex yeah. expectation, like that like people want that from their pastors, right? That, that's what, it, you know, if you're not doing that, there's a problem. You know what I'm saying? You falling short if you're not mm -hmm. doing that. So, wow. Wow. I mean, very good exhortation. Great way to end it. And just to strengthen us as he uh, closed his message there. Yeah, no, uh, the message, that was good. From start to finish, it was like, you know, taking you in this, you know, high, you're going high, high, high. And then he's just like, okay, we're just going to tie a bow with everything. So if people didn't know what wokeness is, listening to this, you know what it is, what it does, what it affects, uh, what is involved. And then I did like what he said. He says, like, it's not if when this issue comes in the church, it's already in the church, right? Right. It's when it's already in the church and he already gave example some of the things whatever is going on mm -hmm. but we don't realize it because like wokeness um undermines the gospel 
that's why those guys uh, ended up, you know, coming up uh, signing the social justice, right? The social justice statement. Yes. Because again, once again, Johnny Mark was just like, hmm, this thing is going to undermine the gospel. But people was like, oh no, it's not a big deal and everything. Now look where we are at, right? We had that uh, MLK 50, they pretty much ushered in MLK uh, into the kingdom. Now you see, you know, his life, some of these things will be like, oh, like, wait a minute, what's going on over here? So like, yeah, all in all, like definitely we, we, we have to be vigilant. Uh, these things are around us, it's no longer out there, right? It's 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 around us. The the names that he mentioned, we know these people, right? He uh, understand Jamaa Tisby. This is not just like ah oh, maybe it's not Joe Austin, okay? It's not talking about Kenneth Copeland. It's not uh, uh, Benny Hinn, but it's like people like those. You be like, man, then what do we do? Because they once, you know, uh, I know Tisby is like a reformed guy, but it's just like man, what's going on over here, right? So it's just like it's very very interesting. I like how he closed with that, you know, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding the yes, work of the Lord. Yeah. Knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. Right, so right. So, like, that's like uh, Josh Bai's signature. Every time mm -hmm. he preaches, he closes with that one. And it's one of my favorite verses. 1 Corinthians yeah. 15, 50, right? Yeah, yeah, 15, 50, at the mm -hmm. end over there. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Beautiful verse. Beautiful verse. Uh, I mean, just a magnificent message, man. So well crafted, well put together. Lots of information, you know, y'all will definitely have to go back and hear it again and again. This is one of those. I can't wait till they officially give like audio and all that kind of stuff, because this is just great to like play in the car and and, and uh, catch the, the nuggets again. Right. Mm -hmm. Catch some of those nuggets that you missed the first time, because mm -hmm. uh, just just a lot of rich information there for us, man. So I appreciate all the work that Daryl put into this message, man. Appreciate the, the Shepherds Conference and all the other great messages. I mean, you got some more that you'll be uh, going through this week, right, babe? Yeah. So, yeah. like, on we're doing a watch party, okay, because we had fun uh, uh, last time. So, get ready. Friday, okay? No sleeping. We're doing a watch party on Friday, uh, 8 p.m., okay? So be back here on Friday. We're going to do a watch party. There's a lot of stuff, good content and everything. I'm excited uh, to enjoy that with you guys. So don't miss the bus, okay? The bus leaves at 8 p.m., okay? <laughs> we leave you behind. You're going to walk, okay? 8 p.m., we are live on Friday. Another watch party. Mm. Another watch party, ladies and gentlemen, on Saturday, okay? That one, we might even start at 7 we're getting it in so i appreciate you guys uh for being here be sure to subscribe to six things above okay because mm. there's another one coming on six things above okay so make sure you subscribe hit the notification bell so you don't miss anything okay mm -hmm. yeah you don't want to miss the bus so get the notification because you're gonna know when the bus is leaving. Yeah. You're gonna know. So when what, the bus what is, is what is seat things above? Because I think you kind of just saying well, I mean, it and like not. Talk about your seat not everybody about knows what seat things. Oh, I'm just saying like you know I'm, I'm just husband. here visiting, so you know you supposed to. This is my to... husband. He's right. visiting my channel, <laughs> Barrier Babes. Okay. Uh, what? 15 years. This is gonna be 15 years. 14 years. She doesn't. You, you lost count at this point. Yes, but anyway, this is my husband. You see what I do with. Well. Thank you all. Thank you all for thank you all for supporting Berean Babes and and for all the uh, um, just good feedback over the last week or so for the uh, Shepherds Conference has been awesome. My name is Lou Violet's husband. My channel is Seek Things Above TV, so it's at Seek Things Above TV. I'll try and leave the link in here for y'all. Oh, look at. Susie Q Susie, with the clutch, gangsta. with the clutch. I know. With the, oh my she's putting God. in the oh link. She's my. holding a baby one end and it's just like I I'm mean, working over here. Okay? Superwoman. <laughs> Susie Q is superwoman, man. Yo, so seriously. Superstar. 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 <laughs> so that, no. that's the link right there. Um, it's in the chat for y'all. If you want to go ahead and subscribe, we'd appreciate that. You know, we do similar content. Mine has, I think, a little bit more of an edge with... Um, Maybe sometimes things that are going on in the world of music and, and entertainment. 
uh, more so than Berean Babes, where it's uh, more Big Eva and other church, really, <laughs> I'd say crazy church stuff that what she she, she she reports on. <laughs> Somebody did ask me what uh, what big what big Eva is. I was just like, oh my god! I just assume everybody knows what big Eva is, but I think it was a no person. Oh. But on Thursday, yes. on Thursday, we are doing a live. Mm -hmm. We're going to be on Six Things Above. Right, okay? right, right, right. So be sure to tune. You don't want to miss that one. Mm -hmm. You don't want to miss that one. Okay. If you think this was, be there on Thursday or be squared. Okay. So get ready on Thursday to uh, to be there. We appreciate you guys. I know it's Monday, you know, uh, people to get to do these things. So I'm grateful that you guys were here uh, yes. to spend this evening with us. We appreciate you. Thank you so much to all the uh, the new subscribers. Thank you for coming in. Uh, we welcome you. We welcome you. So there's a bus that's going to pick you up, guys, on Thursday. I don't know if you have a bus, baby. You want to use my bus? But anyway, so you are no subscriber. I'm bus driving. picks you up on Thursday, on Friday, and on Saturday, 8 p.m., because that's when we are having the live shows. So you don't want to miss the bus, okay? How you not going to miss the bus is hitting the notification bell, is subscribing, is following, is sharing, okay? So follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, okay? I do like to engage, especially on Twitter. So I'm excited to meet you guys. I'm excited to share more content with you guys. So I'm looking forward to seeing you guys on Friday and Saturday at Berea Babes and then on Thursday on Six Things Above TV. Okay? So make, make, sure, make sure you leave a comment because remember, this is YouTube, right? And we are Christians out here. So we are not the priority when it comes to YouTube. So it helps when you hit a like, when you subscribe, okay? Mm -hmm. Fighting the algorithm monster. Amen. And also, yeah. just just forgive her when she does her ten minute goodbyes, because that's just how she I do. I never want to leave because I'm enjoying she, she it. She says you goodbye guys. for ten minutes, so just forgive her for that. You know what I mean? <laughs> but don't leave yet, because we have uh, we're gonna play um, a clip, okay? That uh, my husband made. Well, we'll Very play. Nice. It. We can play it on the way out. We'll just play it on the way out as, that, as that we we we'll leave y'all yeah, with that. Sure. I mean, uh, so but. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, we appreciate y'all. Thank you, guys. You know. I know. Uh, until next time, remember to be in the know. A multifaceted pseudo-religion complete with strictly enforced virtues, internet inquisitions, sins, tenets, public rituals, evangelization, iconoclasm, sacred texts, seminaries, and more. It is a modern leftist cult. It is in reality a one word dialectical repository for such worldly philosophies as social justice, anti-racism, critical race theory, intersectionality, cultural Marxism, liberation theology, womanist theology, reproductive justice, scientific justice, ethnic studies, gender theory, queer theory, drag theory, transhumanism, post-humanism, DEI, SEL, ESG, climate change, environmental justice, or environmental racism. A multifaceted pseudo-religion complete with strictly enforced virtues, internet inclusion.